Great, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Jeff McDonald with the Global Institute for Water Security and it's a pleasure to welcome you to uh, this seminar today. Uh, I'm coming to you off camera by necessity and uh, we're gonna have a, a special introduction uh, by Jay of our, our speaker this week. But before we get going, I just wanna thank the Global Institute for Water Security and the Global Water Futures Program for underwriting this seminar series. Again, our 10th year, I'm so excited that we're 10 years on in this uh, distinguished lecture series. I want to also acknowledge as we do each week that we're gathering here virtually or coming to you virtually from Saskatoon, uh, uh, Treaty, Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. And we pay our respects to these First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm through our water research, our relationship with one another. Uh, I want to note that um, next week we have Megan Koner coming to us from University of Illinois. And uh, that will be our final seminar of this, this fall. And that following this uh, seminar, we will have an early career mentoring session for those that are interested. And that will be via Zoom and I'll put that Zoom link into the chat as we as we go here and you'll be able to see that or, or Tim will on my behalf. But right now I'd like to turn it over to Jay who will be uh, handling this week's introduction. Over to you, Jay. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce our speakers today and, uh, and congratulations to all of us on having done this for, for 10 years. And, and Jeff, I know you've been at the helm for for much of this and just done a fantastic job and bringing people like Tom uh, and next week, Megan, to uh, to talk with us at, at USASC. Tom Gleason is someone I've known for about a decade. I gave my first Burnsell Dreis lecture at McGill when, when Tom was there and graciously invited me, but I've followed his work for a lot longer than that. And Tom is a visionary leader in the field of global groundwater sustainability, who's bringing new ideas about groundwater systems, governance, management, and sustainability to the forefront. I've had the distinct pleasure to co-supervise PhD student Xander Huggins and postdoc Chinchu Mohan with Tom. That has been incredibly rewarding and a very rich learning experience for me. Tom is a self-described water nerd who leads, the, who leads the Groundwater Science and Sustainability Research Group at University of Victoria, who grew up, grew up on Iroquois territory near the Six Nations of the Grand River, and lives and works on the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasonic territories. He loves new ideas, food, and yoga, and helping people and the world. He's a recipient of the AGU Early Career Award, and he's founded the Global Groundwater Blogging Collective called Water Underground. We also have the honor of hearing from one of Tom's collaborators, Tim Kuchiski. Tim is a biologist and a member of the Kuichin tribes who grew up on the banks of the Wuxalo Stalo. Tim has worked with a variety of clients assessing upland, freshwater, and marine ecosystems for 25 years. His work often involves examining the impacts of development on cultural values. Tim has traveled extensively studying the interaction between resource issues and cultural heritage. Over the past several years, he was involved in a major Hulkamidem language revitalization initiative. And he's been a member of the Kowichan Watershed Board since its inception in 2010. So Tom and Tim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the warm welcome. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about groundwater sustainability across scales, from partnering with Indigenous communities to contributing to global initiatives. And as Jay um, introduced, I'm co-presenting today with Tim um, Pulski from um, Cowichan Tribe. So I love this image here of Tim with his hands wide open, both giving and receiving. Uh, Tim is a close collaborator and we've recorded video so that he can be part of this presentation um, while not burdening him with uh, being uh, live uh, in, in real time. And there's another photo on the other side is uh, Tim and I on the banks of the Quixila River. 
Um, and Tim has been a, a, a great um, supporter and collaborator on, the, on one of the projects that we're going to be talking about. So I wanted to let um, Tim introduce himself in a minute, but first I want to make really clear uh, my, uh, land and water acknowledgements um, that are important to start today's talk in a good way. So I live, as Jay said, on Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich territories. And part of this work and where Tim lives is on the Kwuksila Stalo in Kawitsin territory. And both of these have existing and unextinguished indigenous rights and title. Um, and we're, as uh, Jeff uh, mentioned, we are um, coming to you virtually from um, Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. It's an image at Tsochwimia in Kwanameta. Me answer to Plotmitsen. And at Polina. So my grandparents are Violet and Simon Charlie. Our family's Schwatmet is in Kwamachin. And my traditional name is Kat Polina. Also known as Tim Kulchiski, biologist for Couch and Tribes. And with Tim, I've um, put together this slide, which gives a little bit more of a background of Cowitzin territory and the Kuksila Stalo specifically. So in the, in, um, the past, in, in pre-contact times, elders have talked about salmon runs being so numerous that there are runs all year round. Uh, and you could fish all year round. This is a quote um, from uh, uh, Tim uh, and showing an image of the beautiful Coxile Stalo River. Over um, the last hundred years, there was uh, extensive um, uh, impacts of uh, colonialism uh, and assimilation in the, the Cowichan territory. And uh, like uh, the rest of Canada, there was forced removal uh, from villages and children sent to a residential school that has been called Canada's Alcatraz. This is an image of uh, Cooper Island in the back, which is the re main residential school for people from the Cowichan uh, Valley. And this was highlighted, and I recommend you check out a podcast called Cooper Island, uh, which was a CBC podcast, an excellent kind of uh, firsthand uh, recount of, um, of uh, Cooper Island. And more recently, um, there has been a real resurgence in Cowichan territory. Um, there's an image here of uh, Jared Coetzen um, Williams uh, cooking piquan. This is a traditional salmon preparation. Um, salmon is an integral part of um, Cowichan culture. And um, one of the things that Tim really wanted me to emphasize with this slide is the importance from a Cowichan perspective of managing for the health and abundance of the whole ecosystem. So we often um, come from a, a place of scarcity um, and, and, and a lack of abundance in, in many of our systems and governance systems. And, and Tim uh, really wanted me to emphasize uh, that clearly the, the importance of uh, coming more from a, an abundance and ecosystem-based and holistic perspective. My personal um, uh, social location is as a white settler, male and a male academic, and I have many unearned privileges. Um, and I work as an uninvited guest on Coast Salish territory. So this is actually an image of my family in the background. My grandfather's on the, on the far right, and my dad is the, the third boy down um, on, the, on the left. And so I come from a humble settler farming roots in, in Southern Ontario. And I just want to uh, bring that in, in here as well, because that's where I come from. And I try to bring the humility of my roots um, to, to all of these conversations. Recently, I've been really impacted by um, uh, this, uh, a paper that came out in 2020 called Towards Reconciliation, 10 Calls to Action to Natural Scientists Working in Canada. So this was written from the perspective of natural scientists uh, working primarily in field biology, but I think it applies well to um, any hydrologist or water resource person or engineer. So I'm going to read these. These are there's ten calls, but I've um, uh, taken out four that I work with in detail. And we're actually going to come back to this at the end of the um, talk today as a as a small breakout activity. So I'm going to first read these, and I, as I read them, I want you to actually feel what these feel like in your body. 
And then as, as, um, as, as we go through the talk, I want you to think about how you might be able to enact them in your own work and in your own research and in your own learning. And that's what the breakout activity at the end of the talk today is gonna to be on. So Kim, you can put the first um, link to this paper into the chat. We call on natural scientists to understand the socio-political landscape around their research sites. We call on natural scientists to recognize that generating knowledge about the land is a goal shared with indigenous peoples and to seek meaningful relationships and possible collaboration for better outcomes for all involved. We call on natural scientists to enable knowledge sharing and knowledge co-production. And we call on natural scientists to provide meaningful opportunities for indigenous communities to co-create knowledge and participate in science. We're gonna come back to those um, at the end. And Kim, you can start uh, the poll, which we will also come back to at the end. So the poll will come up here in a minute. Um, and you can, I actually ask people to stand up um, in this activity. So I would, I'd like ask you to fill out the poll and, um, and then if you have been actively learning um, about indigenous history priorities and opportunities, I want you to stand up and I'll ask you to do that um, at the end of the talk today as well. So now the, the kind of main two messages of the talk today are, are around one single graph and two key messages. So the first message is that groundwater is a crucial and threatened resource connected to many social ecological systems. And the second is that community-based and global research can unlock solutions and understandings across scale. So the graph on the right-hand side, on the y-axis is scale from local to provincial to global. And on the um, uh, vertical axis is specificity, so context specificity. And so as we move from local scale where everything is quite specific in our social, political, economic, and relational ways. Um, and from, for me, this is in the Salish Sea around Victoria to British Columbia, where it gets a little bit less context dependent globally, where it gets um, even less context dependent. So I'm gonna move along that spectrum in this talk. So how the talk is organized is first in two sections um, around the first key message, and then the third section around community-based research, fourth section around global research, and then the fifth section is moving across scales. And I'll give some preliminary ideas about that. Finally, we're gonna have a, a breakout and I'm gonna leave you with a few challenges that I hope are thought provoking and you can consider uh, as we all move forward together. So first, groundwater is a crucial threatened resource. This has been highlighted by many people, uh, Jay, myself and, and, and Grant Ferguson and many others. So I, and so for some of you who you know think about groundwater all the time, this may be kind of obvious, and you think why care. But for others who aren't don't think about groundwater all the time, I like to share what I think of are five reasons to care about groundwater sustainability, and I have each of these on the next slide, so I won't read them out here. So first, I think that groundwater is a natural climate solution. It's a natural buffer in the hydrologic system, which can reduce the variability of um, climate extremes, acting as storage when we need it um, during uh, droughts and um, a, a reservoir um, uh, during floods. Second, groundwater is a critical resource. At least 30% of Canadians and 2 billion people around the world drink groundwater every day critical to agriculture and industry in many parts of the world. Third, and this is really one of the focuses of my research in the last five years, is that groundwater maintains ecosystems which are impacted by, by pumping. So this is a salmon bearing stream. Uh, a groundwater and groundwater derived base flow is critical for environmental flows in many salmon bearing streams in British Columbia and around the world. Fourth, and unfortunately, groundwater sustainability is threatened, both from a water quantity perspective and a water quality perspective. This is a kind of strange map that I made about 10 years ago, where the mountains of the world, the higher topography, 
are the higher rates of groundwater depletion. So we can see that there are a number of different regions around the world that are um, unsustainably using groundwater. And there's now emerging work around kind of diagnosing and quantifying the uh, groundwater um, quality and contamination and vulnerability around the world. I think the fifth the reason to care about groundwater um, sustainability is that groundwater is often forgotten in water management. This isn't always so, but it often is so. And there's a few different reasons for this that people have put forward. I think two of these are on this slide here. I think groundwater is often forgotten because it's invisible beneath our ground. We can never see it unless it comes out at the surface as a, as a spring or a, as part of a groundwater discharge and base flow. So that's on the left, the kind of invisible person here. And it's very slow. So here is an image of uh, the fall of the Roman Empire um, around 1600 years ago. And that coincidentally is the median response time for ground, global groundwater systems. So they're invisible, slow, and very distributed, so that makes it hard to manage. So those are five reasons, hopefully, that you'll want to pay attention for the rest of this talk to um, what I'm going to be talking about, um, about groundwater resources and, and groundwater systems. And this word system is becoming more and more important um, in my research and in my research group. So um, uh, we've been developing this idea that groundwater is con connected to many um, social ecological systems. And this really is a shift um, that Jay mentioned um, in his introduction from physical hydrology to sustainability science. So I was trained and uh, arguably probably a lot of people who are going to be listening to this with and on the left hand side of this diagram here, where we, I learned all about uh, different types of aquifers, the physical and hydrologic processes that drive groundwater flow. And throughout my career, I've been getting more and more interested and deeper and deeper embedded into what can broadly be called sustainability science. So this is one diagram that we're going to show here where, and I'm going to walk through it in the next slide of um, these frameworks that, are, that we are now trying to apply to groundwater systems to extend and better understand um, our physical systems beyond just the physics of um, hydrology. So this framework that I just mentioned, this social ecological framework is um, a solution oriented and interdisciplinary and holistic framework. And I'm gonna try to explain this framework um, and then we're gonna apply it to uh, some of the systems that I'm working in. So on the left-hand side of this diagram, on the left-hand side of this slide, are the physical systems. So resource systems, these are the big kind of aspects of a, 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 of a resource, where a resource unit is something that we can physically manage. So the left-hand side of this slide and this diagram is kind of the physical system that we're, we're kind of used to as physical hydrologists. Then in the center of this diagram is what's called an action situation, where, and this is where the the framework gets very solution oriented. So we're talking about some sort of change or some sort of action that we do on or with a resource system and a um, resource unit in relation to governance systems and um, actors. And actors can be either individuals or organizations. So that's kind of the core elements of this um, social ecological systems framework. This was um, proposed by McGuinness and Ostrom in 2014. So Eleanor Ostrom is a Nobel uh, uh, Prize winner in economics. So this is this is, this uh, framework is not just coming out from outer space. This is a strong pedigree uh, in uh, in social science and, and and social science literature. So if we think then of this framework as having some sort of um, uh, boundary, just like any kind of physical model, we have boundary conditions. We have to delineate what's in the system and what's outside of the system. We also would want to consider what is outside the system. So I like to describe this as aspects that are um, within, within the boundary of the system are aspects that are on the table when we're in a conversation. And things that are outside of the system are things that are off the table. We're not really talking about in a given action situation. So there, these 
outside of the bound, boundary of the system are broader social, economic, and political systems, and then also related ecosystems on the bottom. So um, uh, one of the students that Jay and I co-supervise, Xander Huggins, has been developing a way of describing groundwater and groundwater sustainability as this social ecological system. So Kim, you can put in the next um, link to a preprint that Xander um, is, uh, has in review right now. And this will give you a more fulsome view of uh, groundwater uh, as a connected social ecological system. But just as a, at a very high level, what I wanna highlight here is on the left-hand side, we have that same diagram of social ecological systems. And on the center uh, part of the diagram, we have this regional groundwater, um, uh, sort of regional hydrologic and uh, coupled um, social ecological system where we have cities, um, industry, farms, groundwater, surface water, different aquifers. And what Xander has done is related each of the parts of this social e ecological framework with parts on this diagram by, by this color-coded element. So for example, one of the action situations could be sea level rise or saltwater intrusion. And then you'd wanna explore what the governance systems are and who the actors are there and what are the resource systems and resource units that would be related to that action situation. So that's a regional picture, but then Xander has also kind of linked this and that's what's on the, the uh, top, uh, or sorry, the side right image here, the global, kind of goals and sustainability elements. So the sustainable development goals, UNDRIP and the planetary boundaries. So we're starting to, and we'll get to the end, at the end of the talk, uh, explore this in more detail, how these regional approaches scale and, and or not to, and, and relate to a global phenomenon. So to make this a little bit more real, I wanted to zoom into British Columbia and show you how we're, starting to apply this social ecological systems framework in British Columbia. So British Columbia has new legislation, new-ish. It uh, was passed in 2015 called the Water Sustainability Act. This was a major modernization of a very old uh, water act um, that importantly included um, regulating groundwater for the first system, included ecosystems as uh, legally um, incorporating environmental flow needs into the act, as well as develop the possibility for regional water management through water sustainability plans. It was unfortunately a missed opportunity to acknowledge the indigenous rights to water um, and that um, through um, things like the United Nations declarations for the rights of indigenous people. And we'll come back to that in a minute. The act has really kind of stalled. It's five or six years on now, and we have no new water plans. We have no new water objectives, but we have a few new drivers in the province, which are really important and driving kind of a new revival and energy around water and water sustainability in the province. First, there is a, a watershed security strategy and fund. This is a, started as a COVID economic relief package of 27 million for um, watershed restoration in the province. And it's now um, being scaled up to a broader kind of policy uh, initiative and funding. The British Columbia more recently also passed um, the, an act called UNDRIPA, so that which confirms and elevates um, the United Nations Declaration for Rights of Indigenous People in British Columbia. And we all know um, that um, BC has faced a series of climate emergencies, many of which um, are water related or have water related impacts. So all these three things have elevated water in the conversation um, in BC again. Um, more locally, um, coming back to the Coxila on Vancouver Island, there have been it's a, it's a series of years where many different people have been concerned about flows, summer low flows in the Quoxila Stalo. Um, and, and so on the graph on the left is from a, a report by Hatfield Engineering, where we have um, the kind of water year um, 
on the uh, x-axis and uh, the kind of mean um, uh, weekly flows over um, uh, uh, the last six decades. And we can see the summer low flows are kind of systematically being um, lowered um, in the watershed. And so that's led to uh, the first use of um, water uh, legal shutting down of pumping um, in for uh, irrigated, irrigation uh, water use uh, for two summers and really has focused people's attention on uh, this watershed. A, a survey um, a couple of years ago within the watershed also highlighted, and this is on the right-hand side, that there are numerous concerns about the watershed. So I'll just read the first one um, and you can check out the rest um, uh, in, in the recorded video. I will lose an important emotional or spiritual connection to the natural environments of the Cox Island. So there are both hydrologic and um, social and cultural concerns um, in this watershed. Amazingly, uh, the, we may be heading towards the first water sustainability plan in the Coxila watershed, which will be a co-governance structure between Cowichan tribes and the province. This has been uh, a long time coming, as Tim will say um, in a minute, uh, but this is an image of um, uh, Chief Seymour signing a memorandum of understanding with Minister, Minister Donaldson a few years ago. And this work of relationship building um, and trust building has been going on in, in depth now for two or three years. This water sustainability plan will be grounded in and led by Cowichan tri tribes, sorry, that's actually Cowichan tribes, not Cowichan tributes, laws, principles, and vision. Some of the possible interventions or options that are on the table are an adaption of license terms or conditions, requirements for water conservation, a moratorium on authorizations, requirements for forest practices, and really taking a whole of watershed um, restoration approach, possibly considering water storage and monitoring by um, indigenous guardians. A lot of interesting and exciting things in the Cox Isla watershed. Um, that are being talked about and, and maybe put into action. So I want to bring Tim back into the conversation here. So the um, it's, a, it's been a long time in coming. The water sustainability plan uh, has finally been put forward. I would say from its inception, uh, it's was heavily underestimated at the value that, that, that that plan had for First Nations. Uh, I know that there were some significant struggles at the beginning and there were kind of uh, several reiterations of the plan and how it, how it could and should come together. Um, despite those struggles, I think we're finally getting to a place where we can actually sit at a table. And we're really hoping that, that this is going to be one of the prime examples, you know, first examples of the value of bringing everybody together to that one table. And I'm talking about the values of the system, the values of the, not just the surface water. Mm -hmm. In this instance, if you're talking about the Cook's Island, you're talking about the groundwater. You're talking mm -hmm. about the, the, the complexity and the values throughout the, the whole system. So I wanna bring all these threads together to talk about how the Coxila um, work and research may fit into this social ecological systems framework. This is just a reminder of what we talked about uh, a few minutes ago. And I'm gonna walk through each element of this framework again and how it applies in this situation. So first on the left-hand side, uh, we have the resource systems of climate, geology, and topography 
and the resource units of groundwater, surface water, and um, aquatic ecosystems. We have an action situation um, that we're in the middle of that of these conversations around water and uh, land use changes to maintain environmental flows in the summer in the Coxsila Stalo. And the governance um, change may be this co-governance with a new water sustainability plan. And some of the actors are First Nations, the provincial government, NGOs, forestry companies, forestry company, and farmers and residents. So what's kind of outside of this um, main kind of uh, system are, are other important things, which by zooming in on all these different elements, we can be in conversation with these really broad priorities in the province and in our nation and, and in um, our discipline of indigenous rights and reconciliation, environmental stewardship and economic recovery. And we can see tangible ways that we're related to all these things. And on the bottom of the diagram, some of the related ecosystems are the ocean in this case, where um, the, the Cook's Island Stalo ends after going into the Cowichan River and um, uh, other uh, neighboring watersheds like the Cowichan River. So that was the, the first kind of elements of um, groundwater as a, a threatened and connected social ecological system. I wanna kind of quickly describe some of our community-based and global research and moving across scales. So our community-based research is in this same watershed of the Coxsila Stalo. And Tim really, and I really wanted to emphasize that we see the Coxsila as a microcosm of the world. So we, we, I'm showing you kind of specific things here, but we wanted to emphasize that we see this as an example uh, for other places and, and our learnings will hopefully be useful for other places. So we're, we've embarked on a, a five-year um, NSERC funded um, project called Quixila Connections. We're interested in how the, of the connections between groundwater and surface water, how people uh, are, how to connect people in the watershed and how to connect um, community science with how water decisions are made. This is a partnership between Cowichan tribes, the province, Cowichan Watershed Board, and the Quixila uh, Working Group. And we have uh, a series of different projects which are all kind of started and in, in process. So the first is a project that we're, a project that's led by a PhD student, Christina Disney on community led watershed monitoring. Um, so we've had uh, a couple dozen um, dedicated community volunteers um, out in the watershed weekly or bi-weekly for the last two summers during the low flow season that we have our uh, an instance of uh, stream tracker app where monitors uh, collect temperature, conductivity, photo and uh, flow presence or absence data um, every week. And that's led to a lot of um, great data and also um, a significant kind of community building and, and narrative building. We're just embarking on a participatory modeling exercise with the kind of steering committee of the Water Sustainability Act where this, um, where this um, uh, working group will define the scenarios for, and approaches for modeling so that the kind of options that are on the table at the water sustainability plan are actually being integrated and uh, used in our model so that we can provide um, impact, or sorry, uh, results in near um, real time. Finally, this project has been really supported um, heavily by um, two community researchers that facilitate a lot of this community science. So um, that's David, the PhD student from the last um, uh, project on the left, myself, uh, Ella Martindale, and Jennifer Shepard. Um, and these two are Cowichan and um, uh, uh, settler researcher, community researchers who are working in detail with, our, with us each week um, and how to engage and continue engaging um, at various levels and scales in the watershed. Where we hope to move that later in the project is um, a, a fourth project led by uh, Deborah Curran, a lawyer from the Environmental Law Center at um, University of Victoria, um, investigating the role of community science, both monitoring and modeling in co-governance and, and most specifically in improved statutory decision-making as this um, uh, water sustainability plan uh, evolves. 
So those four projects are all kind of undermined or so or should I should say supported by um, a data governance structure, which uses um, the First Nations principles of OCAP. So these are ownership, control, access, and possession. So that the data is owned by Cowichan tribes, is stewarded by University of Victoria, and hosted on the ANIC data platform, which is this uh, community-based um, science um, uh, platform and app. That we have um, open data um, licenses, and we use the FAIR principles as well. And these two um, uh, data principles are um, kind of codified in a memorandum of understanding between the partners of Couch and Tribes, Couch and Watershed Board, and the Cox Island Station area. Some kind of first results from our field season so far, again, kind of going back to Tim and uh, knowledge holder, uh, who's a knowledge holder for Couch and Tribes. He reminded us that we're focusing and the volunteers are focusing a lot on the tributaries and that these tributaries might look like ditches. They're quite small and they, they, they're, uh, they're uh, ephemeral uh, streams, many of them. But these are not just, these ditches are not just ditches. And this slogan, this has almost become a slogan for a project. Uh, these are salmon bearing streams or some of them are. Second, uh, insight that we've had is that important tributary creeks in the Cox Isle are run dry during the summer. These creeks that are running dry reveal where groundwater and surface water are not always directly connected and where um, surface water systems are more or less resilient to drought conditions. The last and kind of more social centered insight that we've had is that people in the watershed really care. Um, the volunteers have made new connections with neighbors, with other people in the watershed and really kind of expanded and developed what we call um, their personal narrative of low flow conditions in the watershed. So they are telling stories about what they've found and what, what their watershed is like and what they've learned. And it's, all of that has been very exciting. So I wanna shift now across the other side of this um, graph to global research. And I'm just gonna highlight a few things here and, and provide links to other things. So you may or may not know this, but we're actually in the middle of the um, UN uh, year of groundwater. So March 22nd was the first UN World Water Day on groundwater. There was a large um, World Water Development Report that came out on called Making the Invisible Visible, Communications Challenge of Tell My Groundwater Story. And so there's been a flurry of kind of different initiatives over the last year that are building to uh, a, a meeting in Paris in, in, uh, late, later this year and another kind of global forum um, next early next year. This is um, also kind of building on an initiative that Jay and myself and others co-led uh, a few years ago called the Global Groundwater Statement, a call to action around sustainability. That's, there's a website for that if you want to check this out. And um, another initiative that, um, that I've been co-leading with a colleague, Viviana Ray, um, from Italy called the Water Underground Talks, uh, where we have um, a website and a, a YouTube channel with um, uh, over two dozen talks now of um, BIPOC and women um, researchers sharing their research um, and their passion for groundwater climate and people. Um, and these are being used in classrooms um, around the world. So those are some of the global initiatives that I think are useful and important. And I often get asked why take a global perspective on groundwater? So I have a whole um, uh, talk on this that I gave at GSA uh, a couple of years ago. You can scan this QR code or Kim, you can put the, the link into um, chat. I'm just gonna highlight quickly um, five of those reasons that I, why I think they're um, important. So I think first, a global perspective places groundwater in global sustainability frameworks. I've mentioned already UN Sustainable Development Goals and also the planetary boundaries. Groundwater is largely absent from these frameworks and I think we need to elevate um, and emphasize the importance of groundwater in frameworks like this. A global perspective also helps us understand and quantify groundwater and air system connections. This is research led by a colleague, uh, Mark Cuthbert, 
uh, where we um, tried to quantify where groundwater is connected to climate systems, either in a bidirectional way, which is shown in blue on this diagram here, or in a unidirectional way, um, which is shown in red here. I think the third reason to take a global perspective on groundwater is to inform global water governance and management. So this kind of strange diagram here is about the virtual trade of groundwater. So this is groundwater that's moving in a vir through virtual water trade around the world where depletion happens in one country and the food um, uh, consumption happens in another. This was great work um, led by a uh, colleague, uh, Carolyn Dalin, uh, a few years ago. In this graph here, it, it, um, it shows the first year where the environmental limits of groundwater pumping are shown from uh, in increasing through time from um, 1970 to um, mid uh, 20th century. This was work done um, and completed by collaborator Inga de Graaff. And this is a great example of the fourth reason to care about groundwater from a global perspective. It allows us to systematically analyze problems and solutions globally rather than a piecemeal watershed by watershed basis. And the fifth reason is to create visualizations and interactive opportunities. So here's uh, 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 results from a mapping that I led a few years ago of the modern groundwater in the world. So this is uh, a map, and then we made a, this visualization of two raindrops here, representing the volume of modern groundwater, the very small raindrop, where if we'd expand that raindrop over the, all the continents of the world to be the height of the tallest person in the world, Robert uh, Ludlum, whereas all the groundwater in the world, the older groundwater is a much larger volume, the, the raindrop is much bigger, and if you'd spread that water out over the earth, it would rise to the height of the empire um, state building. So those are some um, kind of small tidbits about um, community-based and global research. And I want to end the, the heart of this conversation with a preliminary ideas of how to move across scale. So again, I often get asked, what is the most appropriate scale for groundwater systems, resources, and sustainability? I'm often asking myself this. I'm working um, from a single watershed to a regional scale to all across um, uh, uh, British Columbia to even globally. And I would say the kind of simple answer is that water phenomenon and water resource challenges happen at all scales. So all scales are important. And we also have sustainability and human rights goals across all scales. So again, we have this sustainability challenges in the Coxsila watershed. We have a Water Sustainability Act in the province. We have UN Declaration of the Rights to uh, Indigenous Peoples that have been encoded in British Columbia and federally and in many other nations around the world. And we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are, have some water related. So this also argues that all scales are important. And I think, and this is just the kind of very cutting edge of my thoughts and the, and the kind of leading edge of where my research group um, is going, is that these sustainability frameworks may enable both systems characterization and solutions transfer. So where we can think about uh, on the left-hand diagram, how the processes scale from local to global scales, and also the sustainability and human rights um, uh, goals scale and interact um, from local to global scales. So I want to um, end the talk today with um, five minutes where we um, come back to these um, uh, uh, four calls to action for natural scientists who are interested in tangibly working towards um, reconciliation. So I'm going to ask uh, Kim to share this uh, Google Doc in uh, the chat. And I'm gonna ask people to um, get in. If you're in the room in Saskatchewan, I'm gonna ask you to get in a group and hopefully um, uh, add something in this Google Doc. For the people who are online watching live, you can um, come into this Google Doc. And I just want to confirm that people on 
can see on my can see my screen of, of the Google Doc. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Now. I see people kind of coming in. So again, um, you can put your name in this Google Doc um, on the left um, if you feel like sharing. And I want you to focus on at least one of these calls. So I read them before, so I'm not going to read them again. I'll, you can um, kind of approach um, the one that you feel like is most kind of uh, relevant to you. And I'm going to kind of pause my talking um, for a minute or two. And then we'll come back together. All right, I appreciate that people are kind of in the dock and working away. I'm going to um, just suggest that this can be kind of an ongoing piece of work that you do, it's certainly a piece of work that I'm doing. And I'm going to end uh, my talk now by going back to my slides. I just want to confirm that we're seeing that correctly. Yep. OK. So I, I, I kind of encourage and challenge you to continue this um, breakout activity. We didn't have enough time to really have a fulsome uh, take at that here, but I wanted to share our poll. Thank you, Kim, uh, that um, most of you, uh, uh, small numbers here, but um, don't work um, uh, or live work uh, in with or for Indigenous communities. Um, most of you have been actively learning about Indigenous history priorities and opportunities, which I appreciate. And many of you bring a global perspective to your research or practice. So with that, I want to give you a few challenges. These are three different challenges that I encourage you to go forth with uh, however you like. First challenge is to consider the opportunities and limitations of applying a global perspective to your research and practice. So this is an active question that you can take. What do these kind of global sustainability and process um, factors, how does that relate to your research or your work? The second challenge is that I challenge you to learn more and act on what you can do in a good way and in the spirit of reconciliation in the territories where you live and work. So I have uh, included here some uh, questions that I have kind of reflected on that I that were inspired by Indigenous cultural acumen training at UVic. There are many resources and examples of um, this type of learning that you can do. Um, and um, on the slide here, I'm just showing a few uh, resources of decolonizing water resources. Um, excellent talk series that UBC put on a, a year ago, a uh, whole research project called Decolonizing Water. Um, also led out of UBC and a great um, uh, paper called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor uh, by uh, Eve and Tuck. The last challenge that I have for you is thinking about a new call, set of calls to action. I feel like these calls to action for uh, natural scientists are, are good, um, but I think they can be even more kind of punchy and uh, more poignant for water. So I, I'm asking this challenge, what could a call to action for water scientists and professionals working in reconciliation look like? In the back end here, I have a very provocative image of um, the uh, piles of dead salmon um, in Helsic territory on the central coast of British Columbia um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and these were identified by um, Helsic guardians. And this is uh, critical kind of food and cultural values uh, for um, this nation. So there are these you know, climate related um, uh, and indigenous uh, community issues that are, are very important across um, uh, Canada. So what are the water specific issues that would be included? How would we um, uh, uh, call systematically and importantly include um, treaty um, and territory rights um, in such a call to action. So I've, I've given you lots of um, different ideas here, and I just wanted to kind of come, everyone to kind of come back to their breath. Uh, and I uh, encourage you, if you feel like 
continuing to work in this breakout activity or writing a poem or inspiration. And I'll just end with a final poem, uh, a haiku that I've written um, recently. Groundwater connects to people and place. Let's all make that visible. Thank you very much for your time. And I, I look forward to any questions and, and continuing the conversation um, after the talk. Wow, Tom, thanks so much for a really uh, inspiring and thought provoking uh, talk. We're gonna open it up for questions. I think uh, we have the Q&A function available. Uh, Kim and Tim there locally can maybe uh, chime in as well. I'm not sure if chat is open in this particular format. Uh, those that are listening might be able to unmic or, or live, certainly. Um, don't forget too, just before we go into it, um, we have a, a, a session, 30 minutes or so, for those that are interested for early career mentoring. And there's been some great discussion of that already on this talk. And I think uh, Tim and Media Productions has just put that link into the chat. So uh, questions, comments for Tom. Just while we're waiting, uh, Tom, for, for questions to, to come in, um, I'm wondering about, it's really inspiring what you, what you showed. And I'm wondering how working in con a context of uh, land where there is a treaty and unceded lands affects the way in which engagement happens. I ask this because I gave a talk to the Okanagan Water Board, uh, Water mm -hmm. Stewardship Council last week. And it seemed from their experiences, it had been very difficult to form or have dialogue that it seemed through global water futures on Treaty 6 territory in Ontario and other First Nations in Saskatchewan on treaty land, those discussions had advanced quite a bit further. And I'm just wondering about special challenges, you know, particularly in BC and, and in your examples that are, are, are there because of, uh, you know, that situation. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, the, <clears throat> and your, yourself and maybe some other people that are listening on, are familiar with British Columbia has a very different um, treaty landscape than the rest, most of the rest of Canada. Much of the province um, is not under treaty. There are a few historical treaties and a few modern treaties. And there are um, nations that are um, in the treaty, uh, the treaty process, and there are nations that are not. So it's a, it's a, de it's definitely a much more uh, complicated and nuanced um, uh, situation in British Columbia. And and certainly all of those um, differences do play into how the province and how the nation, um, individual nations um, show up in their priorities in the space of water resources and water sustainability. So in, in <clears throat> some cases, the um, province uh, is in active um, negotiation with, uh, uh, with nations around um, water rights and, and, and uh, in a modern treaty um, and in others it's not. So I'll just, I guess I'll just say there's no kind of universal um, thing that one can say. It's, it's very kind of um, uh, nation by nation and region by region. Uh, there's a few um, questions that I'll maybe try to answer from the uh, Q&A as well. The first one's from uh, Mohammed Gureshi. Um, thank you for that. Those two questions. I'm not sure if you can uh, add your voice as well, because I, I think I understand your question, but I, I want to make sure. Uh, for uh, I, we we definitely um, consider, or one can consider, human adaption. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, um, but uh, whether that's social or, or cultural evolution as part of these. Um, uh, social ecological systems frameworks. And thank you also for the comment about the uh, nice presentation across scale. Um, so we're, uh, I wouldn't say we're making, uh, we're not doing um, 
uh, hydro social modeling or social hydrologic modeling of the dynamic interactions between farmers and, and groundwater right now. Um, we are considering it. Uh, it's been a kind of a possibility to actually try to model the um, evolution of uh, the co-governance structure in like an agent based model, for example. But right now we're focused more on the scenario planning and, and options development and evaluation for the water sustainability plan. Also, the next question from chat from John Porterfield is, <clears throat> excuse me, the distinction between modern and older groundwater. And um, the modern groundwater is groundwater that uh, has been renewed or recharged um, since uh, the um, late, or sorry, since the early 60s, so approximately the last 50 years. Um, modern is defined as uh, using tritium concentrations. Um, and so it's, um, there, it's kind of differentiating um, uh, old, older and younger water. And this can relate to groundwater um, uh, depletion, but not necessarily. So we can deplete older or younger groundwater. And, and Grant Ferguson led a, a useful uh, paper that I was a part of uh, just a couple of years ago, which was a commentary on kind of the fallacies of uh, using groundwater age um, to really talk um, about um, renewal and um, sustainability. Yeah, um, the next question also from John about people in my group or other people who are pursuing global policies or practices to manage um, sea level rise uh, and the stocks and flows of water and rebuilding historic water tables. These are all big questions. Uh, one of my kind of insights over the year, I'd say the last decade of working across these different scales and trying to engage globally is um, the kind of challenge of there not being a, a, a truly global um, water governance structure. And um, so water is often fit through these other sustainability um, frameworks. Uh, that, and that's why I think it's important to elevate groundwater within the, uh, them, such as the sustainable development goals or the, um, the planetary boundaries. So there are, there is no omnipotent God uh, out there looking to manage um, uh, global water uh, policy and, and, and with some sort of um, levers or, or something like that. Uh, there are ex regional examples of all of this as well. But I don't won't get into regional examples in Jakarta or rebuilding historic water tables um, in uh, northern India through leakage and the uh, uh, irrigation channels. But uh, I'll I'll just kind of leave it there on a global scale. And maybe Tom, uh, a final question from Grant there. I don't know if you can see that. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a nice question, Grant. So the, I think that everyone can see the question of um, kind of data um, and monitoring data. Um, from either government agencies or industry, um, and in relate and, and or how that um, data um, could be from uh, indigenous uh, nations or people and the public in general. So I, I guess I am trying to on this Coxila project as uh, just as an example. We're trying to navigate this exactly using um, uh, community-based data owned by the uh, indigenous uh, nation and uh, open. <laughs> so it, and that's a very, and so it's, I, I think that's a really sweet spot. It's not always possible if we follow kind of OCAP uh, principles that I mentioned before, if, if the data is truly owned by the nation that they may or may not wanna make that data um, open uh, or partially open, uh, depending on their priorities and, and uh, what they, are interested in the in the data for, so I, I think again it's kind of case by case, nation by nation, region by region. There, I don't think there's any kind of universal strategy here, uh, but I think there are kind of emerging best um, 
practices uh, to follow. Um, I'm hoping we're following those and I'm hoping we're gonna continue uh, to kind of follow those in kind of working in a good way with um, nations to make um, uh, data more kind of, uh, place specific and uh, available. Tom, maybe I'll sneak in one last question. This is from Graham Strickard. Have you given consideration to how the SES framework could advance cumulative effects assessment with respect to development projects that say draw on groundwater in similar regions? Hmm. Yeah, great question. I mean, in the, the, I didn't say those words, but those are, that is fundamentally what the um, Coxsila uh, Connections project is about. Uh, the cumulative effects of um, decades of, of, of forestry practices in uh, the upper watershed, which is un, kind of unusually privately held by a forestry company, um, and the decades of cumulative Im impacts of surface water and ever increasing groundwater use, yeah. especially um, for irrigation in the low flow summer series. So yeah, it's kind of under the hood, but that's certainly in our modeling framework in this specific watershed, uh, it, it's kind of inherently kind of a cumulative effects um, study and, and I, so I do think it's it, the kind of this SES framework is is useful um, to as a as a visualization. Uh, I just even last week I was a similar presentation for policy people in the in the BC government and a couple of the policy people are like this is the visualization we've been looking for. <laughs> it's like this is the work we do, and you've given us a new right. way of visualizing that, which at, at least for some people is is super useful. And their work is all around kind of cumulative effects in, in watersheds. That's awesome, and I, I I really appreciate your thoughts on scale. I I I um I I think that uh like the saying, uh, if beauty is at, in the eye of the beholder, key watershed processes are at the scale of the beholder. And mm -hmm. I think we tend to blend scales without really thinking that really, I think it's defining your scale initially and then tackling the problem at that scale, rather than kind of the upscaling perhaps we've done historically in hydrology kind of writ large. Yeah, and, and looking at the interactions between those scales while still maintaining yeah. and respecting the scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay, we're, we're over time. Uh, excellent questions. Excellent talk, Tom. Thanks so much again. We're going to take a five-minute break. And then for those that are able and interested, please come to the, uh, the Zoom link. Uh, Tom, I can send it to you by email. I don't know if you can see it in the, in the, uh, the chat. Yeah, I have it. I okay, have, yeah. Excellent. So we'll see you there in five minutes. You can take a, uh, a small coffee break. And uh, thanks so much again. This is a really great day. Jay, thank you for your introduction. And uh, we'll see you all next week for our final talk of the year.